Uh, I'm Dr Helen Chersky and I study breaking waves and bubbles out on the open ocean. So I'm a physicist. Cool, and what, um, in your own words, what is science to you? If someone were to say to you, what is science, what would be your sort of take-home answer? Uh, there's, there's two things to science, I think. There's the, the method of science, which is the bit that really matters, like the, the fact that it's always critical, it's always self-critical, and it's always exploring and dealing with reality as it is. This is the best description of the world that we have, and you can collect evidence, find it out, um, and that matters. And the other part of it is uh, the sort of the foundational knowledge that has been built up using the scientific method. So, you know, the, the basic laws of physics, the, the rules of ecology, how the system works. Scientists have put in lifetimes of effort using the scientific method to, to work out how we think the world works. And that's, that's valuable. So, yeah, so those two things together. Science is part of the facing up to the world and the way it really is and the thing that I notice in my life that it, about the benefit of science is not you know the phone I've got or the way I live it's the idea that I can investigate the world and that all of us science is, science is for all of us and we can all investigate what's around us it's not sort of um, it's it's a freeing thing science it says well there's lots of things we don't know about the world but if we put the effort in and we think about it, we can find them out. And that's the difference. It's not a fact or a thing. It's, it's a way of living that says the world is amenable to investigation and we're going to investigate. My way of looking at the world is that each of us has three life support systems. We've got our own body, we've got our planet, and we've got the infrastructure of our civilization. And each of those life support systems is keeping us alive. And in order to understand how they work and how to manage them, because we're now affecting them, we need to know how to manage them, um, we need science. And that's, that's, that's the big thing, I think, is that there's all this, there's, you know, science is obviously fantastic for the curious, it's, it sparks the imagination, it adds layers, wonderful layers to the world. But there's a pragmatic reason for studying it, which is that it's keeping us alive. We need it to keep these life support systems going. That's why I've got my octopus here, because uh, I, I study the ocean, and so um, the planet is, is a life support system. We've got wonderful creatures like this living in it, and, and science is part of what helps us manage and understand and live with our environment rather than against it. Um, it's quite good fun actually. What I like most about this is that scientists are not used to agreeing with each other so they'll just about walk along but the whole chanting thing they're not very good at because everyone's saying oh well I, th I think there's a different chant and maybe this would be better and there's peer review going on back here about what the chant should be um, and people are learning as they go so I think it's the whole point about this is that it isn't homogenous. There's a huge diversity of people here. There's a huge diversity of thought here. And there's no reason we should agree on all these little things, but we do agree on the fact that evidence-based science is a foundation for policy and for our civilization. And that's why we're here. Hello. I'm trying to work out how far forward I can stand here. I've got to stand behind this on top. So I want to talk not about science, but about the non-scientists, because one thing that is very important at the moment is that we understand, and I'm sure that's why lots of you are here, that science is not just for the scientists. There's a lot of people who don't identify as scientists, but they need to know too. And to illustrate that, I'd like to tell you about my two grandmothers. Um, my, I'm from the north, you can just about still hear it in my accent. And that means I've got a little northern nana who's very down to earth and very pragmatic. And she doesn't, uh, she doesn't, she's bright, she hasn't had much formal education. And when I was at her house, when I was a second year physics undergraduate, studying quantum mechanics, so I had this folder in front of me, uh, all these hieroglyphics to do with quantum mechanics, and she came over and she said, what's that? And I said, it's quantum mechanics, Nana. Um, and I tried to explain to her something about this, what these hieroglyphics meant. And she looked very impressed. And then she said, oh, and what can you do when you know that? Which is a good question, <laughs> and at the time I'm not sure I could answer it. But now, when it comes to the wider question of a non-scientist asking a scientist, what can you do when you know that? I would say there are three reasons, and they apply to both scientists and non-scientists. The first reason is satisfying curiosity. It's wonderful that we can explore all these things, find all these things, have enthusiasm and appreciation 
for the world around us because science doesn't take away from appreciation, it only makes it greater. Um, and I'm the sort of person that can occupy myself at a bus stop looking at things around me because they're so interesting. That might put me in a minority. Um, the second reason is that I think my way of looking at the world is that each of us has three life support systems. We have our own body, we have the planet Earth, and we have our civilization, the infrastructure of our civilization. And each one of those is keeping us alive in its own way. And you might not be interested in the curiosity, but surely you're interested in keeping yourself alive. And as time goes on, we're having to manage these life support systems, and that means we need to understand them. One of the reasons that climate change is such an issue, uh, why, it's, why it's so important, is that it's two of these systems, the civilization and the planet, butting up against each other. We need to negotiate that boundary, and that means we need to know how those systems work, and that needs science, for the scientists as well as the non-scientists. And the third reason has to do I'm going to illustrate by talking about my other grandmother. Now, my uh, Polish grandparents came as refugees to England during the Second World War. And they started from scratch in this country. They lived in a, a refugee camp near, in Doddington, near Crewe. And they, one of the first things, that so they had been teachers in Poland, and one of the first things they struggled to afford when they first came to the UK, there were two things, one for Babcia, who's my grandmother, and one for Jadek, my grandfather. But, and for Babcia, it was a sewing machine, and she didn't want to learn to sew. But sewing was a way that she could do stuff, way that she could make money. And the sewing machine was interesting, and I still have it. It was one of those Singer pedal-powered things, you know, with a foot pedal. Um, and it was a beautiful thing for two reasons. The technology that goes into making the sewing machine, and there's the technology in using the sewing machine. And there's, that's not, sewing is not associated with technology. It's generally done by, been done by women. And there's a lot of things that women have done through history which have not been labelled technology, but when you look at them, they absolutely are. And sewing is one of those things. So the sewing machine for Babcha was her way out of a situation. It was a way to build a new life, and it was a way to make life better. And, so techno and the technology is made possible by science. Once you understand systems, you can build technologies, you can improve your own life, you can improve the way that society runs. Um, and you've got a great platform for actually doing things. So the third reason that I would say to my English nana is that science makes technology possible. And we live in a technological society. We need to keep improving. We want to understand how it works. So the final thing, I'm just going to, you may have noticed, anyone who has been around the front of the thing, I've got a pet octopus with me. Um, because, first of all, because we're humans and I have a toy octopus and I'm not afraid to admit it. Um, <laughs> great enthusiasts for things in the ocean and an octopus is probably the closest to alien life that any of us will ever meet. I encourage you to meet one if you get the chance, they're amazing creatures. Um, and so the last thing I just want to say is that one of the privileges of being a scientist is getting both to visit things like the ocean and talk to people about the ocean and the engine of our planet, that second one of our life support systems. That's where I work as a scientist and it's not about me. It's not just about the fascination, it's because we all live on this planet. We all need to understand how it works. We, the scientists, need to have conversations about what we understand, respectful conversations. Scientists are not generally very good at listening, and I recognise this irony in me, me standing up here saying that. Um, but we need to get better at listening and having conversations about what it, with just people, the people around us, the grocers, the, you know, whoever it is we bump into in the shops, we need to listen to them and have conversations. And when we know about something as wonderful as the ocean, in my case, I think we all need to just have low-level conversations with the people around us and tell them. Be known to them as people. Don't stand up and spout at them. Have a conversation. Become known as a human being. Because what we need to convey about science now more than ever before is not just our understanding of the world, but the spirit in which we do science and the spirit in which we find things out. And we will only do that when, we're, when we meet people and talk to them and show them how we think about the world. So that is my little pitch for science being for non-scientists, just as much, if not more than it is for scientists. I'm so glad you're all here being enthusiastic about science. Go out and have those conversations. Get out your toy octopus and enthuse everybody else about science. Thank you. Yeah.